I teach at American University. I was named Peace Educator of the Year by 500 college campuses and universities last year for my work on peace and social justice. But I've been involved in the great civilizing movements of our day, labor movements, women's movements, uh, civil rights movements, uh, peace movements, nonviolent movements to end all forms of violence in all its manifestations uh, since 1977. I think it was a confluence of different factors. It was my teachers growing up. Um, Mr. Shoup, my fifth grade science teacher, lowered the U.S. flag in 1970 and raised the first Earth Day flag and taught us uh, critical consciousness around the environment. And um, I got very involved in the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, uh, the Endangered Species Act, and then Three Mile Island happened where we almost had a nuclear meltdown um, while I was in high school in Pennsylvania. So I joined the Mobilization for Survival which was a big movement against nuclear and atomic power and nuclear and atomic weapons. And there I joined a beautiful community of spiritual, uh, uh, ethical people striving to protect and heal the planet. And I met such giants as George Lakey, uh, who had written many books on nonviolence and started the um, uh, creative communities for nonviolence downtown uh, and wrote things like the nonviolent revolution. Um, so that my teachers connected me and also my parents. Uh, my parents also raised us to really be aware and involved. Um, we had lived all over the world. Uh, my dad had been a diplomat in the US Foreign Service um, after fleeing the Holocaust in Europe. And my mom was involved in the radio industry in New York. and. Uh, they really brought us up to be very internationally minded, very aware. Uh, they were very involved in Native American causes, civil rights causes, uh, and um, civic engagement. I think it makes sense. It's very rational, it's very practical. I've always found violence, bloodshed, and war very wasteful. I, I hated the destruction involved with it. Uh, from a very young age, I didn't understand the irrationality of war. And I was like, how, how can you bomb people into peace? Uh, but also, something happened to me when I was growing up. During the Vietnam War, people kept talking about guerrilla warfare and the Viet Cong. And I thought, King Kong, guerrilla warfare. I thought we were fighting apes in Vietnam as a seven-year-old. And then I saw a picture of a little girl running down the road with napalm dripping off of her skin. And she was totally naked and US soldiers were behind her and they had just set her village on fire. And I thought, oh my gosh, she's about my age. She's about seven years old and she's so vulnerable. She's so naked and her skin is burning. And why are those soldiers burning her village? And I went to my parents and I said, we're not fighting apes in Vietnam, we're fighting human beings. And they said, of course we are. Where, where did you get the idea that we were fighting monkeys? And I said, well, Viet Cong, guerrilla warfare, and I was so confused. And from that point forward, I really fixated on why are we doing this? Why are we uh, fighting this war? And my older sisters were very involved in peace marches they were going to burn the American flag in front of their high school against the war. And my mother went to them and said, no, you must wash the American flag of its sins of slavery and what we're doing in Southeast Asia. And they got much better press coverage. So at a very young age, I began to see that when you don't attack, when you're not hostile, when you're not destroying, um, and you're trying to bring people along and be healing, uh, to wash the flag, that people responded much better and they stepped up and they surrounded the flag at that high school that day. This was a, a famous uh, act by Norman Thomas, the great socialist uh, candidate for president. He was the one that told us to wash the American flag of its sins way back in the 20s and the 30s he ran for office. So I began to see that communities that practice loving nonviolence um, were more likely to be effective and then of course
was we had the gold standard, which was the civil rights movement. And they taught us so much about how not to bring people to their knees, but to bring them to their senses. And um, they modeled nonviolence. They inculcated it. They, they internalized it. And they got huge victories, uh, with, not, at, not without great personal loss, of course. But um, they were the ones that inspired the anti-war movement. The civil rights movement doesn't always get credit for that. So I lived through two huge movements when I was only nine, 10 years old. And I began to see the effectiveness of that and the irrationality of war. And then we saw the rise of the environmental movement and the women's movement. And they too made great strides. And I saw that through nonviolence, you can make huge gains in a society without bloodshed. And of course, I've witnessed that all over the world now, but the Orange Revolution, the Purple Revolution, the Cedar Revolution, the Velvet Revolution, um, so many different nonviolent revolutions, not all of which have succeeded, um, but they are building a critical mass, a critical storehouse of knowledge about how nonviolent struggle works. Well, I think the rise of neo-fascism does really challenge our thinking around this, and um, there have been some profound discussions and debates in the field, uh, and the Dartmouth professor who wrote the Antifa handbook um, does give us some good food for thought, where he said, you know, that Hitler only started out with 30 young men as followers, and if you don't put the kibosh on that, it will grow. Um, and we are seeing those trends all over Europe, in Sweden, in North America. Uh, there have been latent and under the radar hate movements, of course, since the founding of the Republic, um, but they weren't given legitimacy and a platform, um, and now with social media, they're amplified and magnified. Um, so it does profoundly challenge us. Do we use fisticuffs? Um, or do we uh, in some way try to cut these movements off at the knees? Or do we try to convert them, transform them, uh, bring them along? Many of them are downwardly mobile white males who feel marginalized, just like we see with extremist groups in the Middle East. So what are the best strategies for that? The research shows that you have to have greater inclusivity. Um, and greater role models and, and spiritual figures and legitimate moral figures that can try to convince them to lay down their arms. Um, there are really hardcore people that are not gonna be willing to do that that are just really, really full of hate. Um, what do we do? What do we do? Uh, we have to band together as a community. I use the Supreme Court Justice Brandeis's famous quote that the way to counter hate speech is with more free speech. Um, so we don't want to necessarily suppress those movements because they're going to come out in even uglier ways um, and maybe have like many-headed serpents. Uh, but I do think it's a huge challenge to nonviolence. And I do think that the Antifa movement, Antifa, um, is, is fostering a healthy debate. Well, peace teams are unarmed bodyguards for human rights that go into war zones and conflict areas to protect villagers and unarmed civilians from the death squads. And they had been relatively unknown, relatively uh, marginalized. They were very well respected among a very small circle of people, particularly in the UN. Um, even in the military, they knew of these peace teams willing to put their bodies on the line, to act as a buffer, to stand in the way, um, but they were not well known. And so the US Institute of Peace gave Nonviolence International a grant to try and raise the profile of these groups. Uh, the first of which really were the Quakers that went into China to try and help with a famine in 1923. But we've had many, many movements of nonviolent interventionary forces across borders over the years that have been invited by the locals. They're unlike the Marines in that regard, that they go in at the invitation of the locals, and Peace Brigades International was one of them. They were invited in 1981 by uh, Ninth, a woman whose husband had been disappeared by the Guatemalan death squads. 
and she invited Peace Brigades International. These were Quakers, Gandhian disciples, and Buddhists. Uh, and we went down, and Peace Brigades have been there ever since. Uh, in Guatemala since 1981, and 9th is now a member of the Guatemalan Parliament. Um, and so we wanted the record to be better known of the effectiveness of this. Uh, would you rather walk through a dangerous neighborhood or a dicey neighborhood by yourself or with a big group of friends? Um, and it turns out that these peace teams were highly effective in acting as a deterrent wherever they had operated in about 17 different regions of the world, they had quelled violence. The presence of internationals had de-escalated bloodshed in the area. Bad guys don't want witnesses, and international passports acted as a deterrent. Uh, so we actually highlighted and featured and showcased that work to mainstream policymakers here in Washington, to elected officials, and to foundations. And we basically put peace teams on the map. Um, and there was a report that was published, an evaluation report uh, by uh, the US Institute of Peace, which is a congressionally funded uh, foundation, research center, training center, and think tank. And um, so it was an effort to bring together much more mainstream policymakers, journalists, analysts, social scientists, funders, with these very kind of what they would be seen as uh, very grassroots kind of ragtag or humble, very simple peace teams, pacifist peace teams, trying to protect the lives of civilians. It was a very interesting meeting of the minds. Yes, Michael was the one that wrote the grant proposal. I was based as a U.S. government official at um, the U.S. Institute of Peace right before that conference happened. Um, I was also heading up a big consortium of colleges and universities uh, in the United States. Uh, it's now called the Peace and Justice Studies Association. So I activated a lot of those networks and we worked together on the conference and on the conference report. Uh, well, there's a lot to tell, and I was not on the ground in those conflicts. I was back in the office trying to raise money for them. But um, the uh, Indonesia project was very, very interesting because we witnessed a lot of transitions in Indonesia at this time. The Indonesian military was highly repressive, and still is in places like West Papua. Um, but uh, the tsunami hit uh, in 2005 in the coastline of Indonesia. And there had been a free Aceh movement underway there, an armed struggle against the Indonesian military. Uh, and the tsunami ended up bringing the parties to the conflict together. Peace Brigades International was the only one on the ground who spoke Achenese. And so we acted as interpreters and translators for the huge influx of humanitarian groups that came. Um, so we witnessed uh, periods of, of huge repression um, and huge human rights violations by the Indonesian military, but then we also stayed on the ground through a transitionary period of peace building. And the Indonesian human rights groups did not want us to leave uh, Indonesia. They said, we want to prevent the next escalation of conflict in our societies. We would like Peace Brigades International to stay and institute peace education peace education, peace libraries, peace schools, and we said it must be grounded in Indonesian traditions, in Muslim traditions. You are largely, well, the largest Muslim country in the world, so we would like you to uh, institute these programs based on Islamic principles of peace and pacifism and nonviolence. So that is, in fact, what Peace Brigade stayed, stayed and did. It was kind of outside the box for us um, to be in the role of training workshops for peace education, but it's what the locals ask us to do in their local languages. Then Peace Brigades was the only group still left in West Papua. The, uh, crisis, uh, uh, the International Crisis Group had been kicked out. The International Committee of the Red Cross, the International Republican Institute, the International Democratic Institute, uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, all of them had been kicked out. Um, but Peace Brigades was still based there witnessing the destruction of the rainforest 
and mass atrocities against the indigenous people in West Papua. Um, so we were the eyes and ears on the ground, and the Indonesian military did not kick us out, but we did get uh, reports and eyewitness accounts out to the big human rights groups that engaged in naming and shaming campaigns and tried to you know, uh, shine the spotlight on the human rights violations. Nepal was a different project where there was a Maoist conflict uh, going on against the king's forces, and again, it was locals that invited us in, doctors, student groups, and human rights lawyers. And so there's a very careful, deliberative process of assessing would we actually have leverage in that conflict, or would we make the locals more of a magnet for violence. And so a exploratory team deployed to Nepal, talked to all the parties in the conflict, saw if we could get legitimate working papers and operate there. Um, we never go in under the cover of night. Um, and uh, so they did raise, we all raised the funds to start a Nepal peace team um, with Peace Brigades International. It was interesting because as the Peace Corps was pulling out their volunteers, Peace Brigades was going in. And uh, Peace Corps volunteers said, well, we've learned the language, we, we learn Napali, and we know the culture, we don't want to leave. So some of them tried to transition over through the training and the vetting and the interviewing and screening process to then become members of Peace Brigades International. Uh, there's a lot more I could say about those projects, but in the interest of time, I'll stop there. Absolutely, so it seems like you've done a lot with like um, transnational and culturally relevant uh, nonviolence and peace studies. So how has that influenced you as an educator of nonviolence and peace? Well, I think it's made me more authentic, uh, more humble, uh, because I've listened to what the locals have to say about what needs to be done. They have agency, they have ideas, they know their culture. Uh, and they say Westerners have really interfered over the centuries in our livelihoods, in our uh, natural development, in our cultural values. Um, so learning to listen to best practices that have succeeded in different combat areas of the world, in different um, post-conflict reconstruction. And I bring those stories to my teaching and say, I don't have all the answers. You know, peace is very, very complicated. Nonviolent struggle is no guarantee of success. But here's what the people in uh, Sudan have taught me. Here's what the people in Uganda have taught me. Here's what the anti-apartheid movement taught me in, from the 80s, uh, you know, in Colombia, in El Salvador. And uh, so it's, I think, enriched my teaching and um, being on the ground in these various places. You know, I led a delegation of 300 labor union presidents and labor union organizers to El Salvador in 1987 um, because so many trade union activists were being killed um, by the death squads there. And the very first night we arrived, the military blew up the conference facility where we were supposed to be meeting. And the Jesuits um, who hosted us said, we'll simply move you to a new location. And they had this deep and abiding faith um, in their Lord and that they were doing the ethical, moral thing. Six months later, their throats were slit in the middle of the night, including their cook and their, the cook's little boy. And I'll never uh, forgive myself if bringing in such a huge delegation of labor union activists actually put them more in the crosshairs of the death squads there. But they wanted to be part of the human rights struggle. And they, they were the ones that invited us to come down to try and protect school teachers and nuns and priests. And, um, and so many people died in that civil war. But it makes me very humble that you uh, don't always know the unintended effects of your actions and that um, you have to take a leap of faith sometimes and go into the void. Uh, but they did not die in vain. We cut off military aid to El Salvador after that massacre for a while, thanks to people like um, Congressman Jim McGovern on the Human Rights Commission on the Hill. Well, I come from an interfaith family, so we have Muslims, Christians, and Jews in my family, and uh, we actually even have Hindus now. Um, and uh, I'm not going to be Buddhists, 
But uh, yes, from a very young age, we were grounded in scripture. We um, did go, we did celebrate both the Jewish and the Christian uh, holidays. And I feel like religion is a heart in a heartless world sometimes. It can be an anchor, it can be a foundation for you. I'm, my, my biggest faith is in the human race. I mean, I, I, I don't worship any one deity, any one God, God, but my faith is in the human race. And our ability to overcome adversity, to practice social courage, to stand up for the rights of other people, because that's what history has been about. Um, and uh, there's a lot of ugliness in the world, but there's also a lot of beauty, and we have to hang on to that. For me, nature is the most important religion, and so I, I feel that I kind of worship the earth. Um, I think that's called eco-feminism, and so that's my religion, really. But it's all interconnected. It's the values of doing unto others as you would like to have done to yourself. And all the world's religions share that golden rule, all 27 of them, if I can remember them all, but yeah. Uh, communities, uh, oasises of peace building that I see all around my life. Um, so I'm part of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. Wow, what a powerful group of housewives, mothers, school teachers, every, every age, every stripe, every color. Um, and we get together all the time, every week. And we are flipping the script on gun violence in the United States. And I've been part of women's movements like that all my life. And um, they are very sustaining and very nurturing and very beautiful. Uh, so um, I uh, was part of Women in Black um, against the Israeli occupation in the West Bank and Gaza and in the Serbian occupation uh, in the Balkans and uh, did silent vigils. I, um, have been part of interfaith communities like the Sisterhood of Salim Shalom, which are Jewish women standing up against Islamophobia in their communities when mosques have been defaced, uh, and Muslim women standing up for congregations um, when their temples have been uh, graffitied and painted over, and they sh break bread together and have meals together on Friday night. And it's not a political group, it, they're not talking about religion necessarily, they're sharing commonalities. Uh, there's many, many communities like that in my life. I feel very fortunate to be teaching at AU. My students give me faith and hope all the time. They're so intellectually thirsty, sitting forward in their seats, so eager for learning, um, so full of questions, and so full of promise. Um, but I stand on the shoulders of giants who come before us in nonviolent movements, and I learned that history at a very young age. Um, so that sustains me as well. Well, I think they have to go through a set of experiences uh, that um, shows they can't turn away anymore, they can't put their head in the sand, uh, they can't be in denial necessarily, uh, and through education, through education, grassroots organizing. I mean, the Quakers say to us, each one, teach one, right? So you're going to listen to people you trust more likely than a stranger. So I think it's through uh, relatives and loved ones reaching out uh, that has helped shift some of the conversations in our country. And um, I think people are starting to realize that uh, nonviolent protest uh, it is very respectable. There's been a lot of social science studies done on this now, that people that did not believe in climate change saw climate movement uh, rallies and marches, and they said, hey, these folks aren't crazy. You know, maybe I should start paying attention. And they were more likely to act and get involved after witnessing a climate protest. That the signs made sense. It was really a logical, uh, thing to pay attention to. And so they were more likely to get involved, including Republicans. So marches do work, and when we approach 3.5% of a population, then you have a critical mass, and you have a paradigm shift, and you have a breakthrough in the thinking. This is what happened with the LGBTQ community in the United States. 
10 years ago, nobody was talking about you know, same-sex marriage, even Obama was against it. And then people reached out to their loved ones say, hey, mom and dad, I gotta tell you, I'm actually gay, or I'm actually bi, or I'm non-binary. And it began to shift people. Um, so that kind of conversation um, uh, you know, among loved ones, relatives, friends, I think can have a cascading effect. And that also gives me hope. The research shows that wars are in decline, that the number of people dying in wars are actually in decline since the 1990s. Uh, now, Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq spike those numbers thanks to those invasions and civil wars. But the long-term trend since the last 500 years is that homicides are in decline, the number of people dying in wars is in decline, um, and that is because of the rise of global civil society and the great humanizing movements of our day and global peace networks, you know, international criminal courts, regional bodies for security, peace education in the schools, um, social movements, new literature, scholarship. There's about uh, 40 different pillars of the global peace system and they work as a system to try and move the world away from legal violence, gender violence, environmental violence, racial violence, military violence. We're nowhere near where we need to be, but we're trending in the right direction. Now, 2016, it has been a watershed year in the opposite direction. And there was a huge crackdown on the nonviolent movements in the Middle East after the Arab Spring because the authoritarian regimes there feel so threatened. I would submit it's because the civil society was acting so effectively and calling into question the legitimacy of these immoral governments that we got, you know, al-Sisi in Egypt and Erdogan in Turkey and all these. We have 53 right-wing authoritarian regimes in the world now. Um, that's a huge global pushback against civil society. So it's going to be a struggle. Um, we're, you know, four steps forward, seven steps back, you know, um, but I feel like we're getting there and young people are woke. I mean, they are marrying in interracial numbers, in record numbers like we've never seen. They're much more accepting. They're going on the climate strike all next week. Um, they are, you know, not as rigid in their uh, ideologies. They're much more open. Um, and I've seen them spontaneously use nonviolence in all different places. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement, anti-police brutality movements, they did not necessarily always have formal training in nonviolence, but they knew how to shut it down. This has been Barbara Ween speaking with Nonviolence International, and happy birthday, happy anniversary, happy 30th, woo, for Nonviolence International, you guys rock. And they have been building the capacity and the training and the knowledge for nonviolent struggle all over the world, from the Burmese jungles to uh, Standing Rock and everywhere in between. So I have the greatest admiration for Mubarak Awad, Michael Beer, and the other founders um, that have you know, sacrificed a lot. Uh, they never intended to become rich, but they've been enriched uh, by this work. So thank you for including me in your anniversary celebration.